Um, just, how many uh, people here are Spanish speakers only? Everyone's bilingual? ¿Alguien aquí este, habla solamente español? Pregunto para saber si es mejor hacer el foro en español o si podemos proseguir en inglés. So, English is okay with everyone so far? Perfect. Thank you very much for coming. Mainly the two organizations that are putting this, this event together is Sacramento Immigration Alliance and Unión Cívica Primero de Mayo. And the sole purpose of this event is to provide the community members with information about the Trust Act. It is the state law that passed this year and essentially limits deportations. It limits the authority that local jails have over community members that might have been arrested for any misdemeanor. And my colleagues will talk more in detail about it. And I think I'm, I'm gonna have some more folks coming in, so I'm just gonna give them a minute. While people start coming in, feel free to grab a, a bottle of water. And just FYI, there will be food towards the end, so stick around. Make sure to sign in. One of the um, main things that we want to get out of this program as well is knowing what's important for you, knowing uh, what resources you need, what information you're looking for, what things can Sacramento Immigration Alliance and Union Civica Primero de Mayo work on so that we can provide you resources and information for you to be informed more than anything. So whether it's information in schools, um, health, anything that you need, let us know and we'll make sure to do the research and make sure that we provide you that information. And before I begin, I actually want to thank Don Arturo, Arturo Ramos, who is the owner of this arena. Can you give my hand of applause? Gracias, Don Arturo. Um, it was very important for me to make sure that this forum took place here because this arena essentially is the second home for many of us. Um, you see generations after generations playing soccer here, and I think we have one of the families here, Dulce Valdera. They themselves play soccer, and I know their kids will soon be doing the same. And a lot of their community are undocumented. So this is one of the reasons why it was so important and symbolic to have this forum here. I myself, Alma Lopez, again with Unión Cívica, Unión Cívica Primero de Mayo and Sacramento Immigration Alliance, I'm here, as well as many of my colleagues, to support you and to provide you with anything that is possible to make sure that you live a life that's with dignity and respect. So before I go on and tell you about our program, I want to make sure everyone signs in. Like I said, we want to make sure that we have your information, which is confidential, and essentially it's for us to know what, what it is that you need for us to work for you. I'm gonna go ahead and get started and introduce Kiran with ACLU. She's gonna come and talk to you briefly a little bit about the history of the Trust Act. After that, we're gonna have Angela Chan with Asian Law Caucus to tell you about the status of Sacramento, Sacramento County and what's happening in our county right now. So Kiran? Uh, 
Um, and thank you to all of you. I think a lot of you also worked on the Trust Act, and it really um, was a three-year community effort. Um, it didn't get signed the first time, it didn't get signed the second time, um, but it really took everyone working together, it took people standing up and telling their stories who've been directly impacted. And Alma asked me to talk about the history, and that really is the history of the bill. Um, and I know, you know, a bill takes a lot of lobbyists, it takes a lot of advocates, it takes a lot of politicians, vote for it, but this was a bill that took people who had been unfairly arrested and it took people who had been victims of crimes and it took people um, who had been threatened with deportation standing up and saying, this is me and this is what happened to me and, you know, Governor Brown, I need you to sign this bill and sheriffs throughout the state, I need you to change your policies so this doesn't happen to me and this doesn't happen to my family and this doesn't happen to my children. Um, and that's really what got this bill passed. Um, we had a woman here in Sacramento, her name was Juana Reyes, and she was arrested for selling tamales outside of the Walmart. And I know a lot of you probably remember that, and some of you stood with her and said, this isn't okay, we can't have people arrested for selling food without a permit and separated from their children, which was what happened to her. She was held in jail um, on an ICE detainer and threatened with deportation and separation from her children. And that's exactly what the Trust Act um, is here to prevent. Um, we had another woman, her name is Ruth, she's from Bakersfield. She was arrested um, and taken away from her small children um, because her dogs barked too loudly. Um, and I know a lot of you also came out to a bark-in for her, possibly with your dogs, <laughs> here in Sacramento. Um, and you know, it was also her saying, I will not be separated from my children. There has to be a better solution. State of California, we can do better than this. Federal government, we can do better than this. Sheriffs throughout the state of California, we can do better than this. Um, so that really is the history of the Trust Act. And it was also people in their local communities saying, as a county, we can do better than this. As you know, Santa Clara County, San Francisco County, and now Sacramento County, we can do better than this. Um, and, you know, at sort of a national picture, we now have almost 2 million deportations. We're about to hit that mark. And that's a really sad day for this country. And one of the big reasons that the federal government is able to do that is a program called Secure Communities um, and, and several other similar programs that allow immigration enforcement to use local law enforcement and the resources of our local communities to detain immigrants. Um, and to have access to that information and to share that with the federal government. And so what we want to do through the Trust Act is really limit when local jails are holding immigrants for extra time just because of their immigration status. We want to limit that with the Trust Act. And that is what we have done. And we really want to make sure that everyone understands, that law enforcement understands, and that everyone in this room understands that what the Trust Act is is a statewide standard. It is the law now throughout the state. Every, every sheriff has to comply with the Trust Act, but it also is a minimum standard because every time a sheriff is asked to hold someone just based on their immigration, immigration status, it is a request, and no sheriff ever has to do that. Every sheriff can say, I can do better. I believe in this community. I believe in keeping families together. It is the right thing to do. It is not a good use of my resources to keep immigrants in jail for extra time. It is always, they always have that option. And that is why we have policies like Santa Clara County where nobody will be held in jail for extra time just based on their immigration status. Um, and what the Trust Act does is really set a floor and say there are cases where we will never hold somebody in jail just based on their immigration status. And Sandy's gonna talk a lot more about exactly what you have to know to protect yourself, what are those situations in which you cannot be held anymore on what's called an immigration detainer, um, and what are the exceptions that were built into the Trust Act where you can still be held on an immigration detainer, and Angela's gonna talk about the Sacramento County policy and exactly where we are with that, and what's happening in Sacramento County, and how Sacramento County can do better. Um, but what you really have to know is that as of January 1st, this is the law, um, and we have we have passed this thanks to all of you. Um, and and there are many many circumstances, including every time you are charged with or convicted of a misdemeanor, you can no longer be held for extra time in jail just based on your immigration status. And that's really important. It's really important that we're all working together so that we can know if if things are happening that shouldn't be happening. 
um, because it's that kind of community power and that kind of working together, that kind of looking out for each other that's going to make sure that this is a successful law um, and not just something that we pass, but something that actually works and protects our community. So I'm going to leave it there and turn it over to Angela to let us know about exactly what's happening in this county because there are 58 counties in the state of California. Um, and it's really important that we all sort of know what's happening in our local community. Um, so Angela's been doing really great work on the trust act since the very beginning, on writing it, on lobbying on it, um, along with the other three, four organizations that really work to pass this. So Angela, come on up. Thank you, Karen. Hi there, thank you for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna talk about where we are uh, with the Trust Act in Sacramento and uh, how you can help with implementation. And I'm Angela Chan, I'm a senior staff attorney at Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. It's a nonprofit civil rights organization based in San Francisco. We provide direct legal services in a number of areas, including immigration, uh, criminal justice, housing and employment, and we were uh, co-sponsors of the Trust Act along with the ACLU, California Immigrant Policy Center, MALDEF, and also National Day Labor Organizing Network, and we're so happy the Trust Act is signed, and now that we're, now we're focused on implementation. Um, so, um, where we are with the Trust Act is that it's now law. Does anybody know when it became law? January 1st. January 1st, thank you, so everybody knows. So it's January 1st it became law, and as Karen said, it's law in every county in California. There are 58 counties, and it covers all counties, unless a county actually has more protections for immigrants, like San Francisco or Santa Clara. In those counties, their higher policy takes effect. But in Sacramento, we don't have that, so the Trust Act is what applies in Sacramento. Um, so where we are, and, and people in this room probably know, which is why you're here, that there's been um, some rough patches in implementation in Sacramento County. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like there were a few cases um, that we know of, there could be more, where people were held in violation of the Trust Act, meaning that an ice hold was sent to the jail for somebody that was protected by the Trust Act, and Sandy will explain who's protected by the Trust Act. And rather than releasing that person, when the criminal matter let that person be released, the jail held them uh, for ICE to pick them up. And we've seen that, unfortunately, in a couple cases. A really brave family here today just joined us, uh, Julie and Martine. If you want to just wave your hands. Uh, they... Thank you. They've gone through quite an ordeal. They actually um, were, Martine was held in violation of the Trust Act and luckily was released after some uh, midnight advocacy along with uh, Risa Morris, who's a local immigration attorney. Um, so we've seen some ups and downs. Um, as a result of these types of cases that we've seen, we did meet with the Sheriff's Department, and I know there were uh, other groups also that met with the Sheriff's Department around this issue. We met with Chief Deputy Milo Fitch, he's the Chief, Chief Deputy for Sacramento County, and we asked him, where are you with Trust Act implementation? Meaning, do you have a policy for your department so that everybody in your department, from your local, you know, from your jail staff that's at the jail door to you know whoever's dealing with booking and whoever's you know everyone in your department, do they know about the trust act and they're supposed to apply it? Because we've heard of cases where people have gone and asked your jail staff about the trust act and they said they don't know or they don't understand. It. Um, and what Chief Deputy Milovich said is that they issued a memo on February 11th, so that's a, a, over a month after the law became you know, a law, um, they issued a memo that started explaining to staff what the Trust Act is. So that's a start. Um, we asked, well, you know, that, that's just a memo. Do you, are you putting together something that's more permanent, that's more of a final department policy that all your staff gets trained on and receives? Um, they said that they'll work on it. Um, the, the positive thing is they said they'd also take our feedback and give us a chance to look at a draft. So I'm, I'm talking up here giving this presentation because I got a chance to actually look at the draft and I shared it with some members in this room. And I, we provide some feedback and some of the feedback that I just want to highlight for you is that, um, and we've noticed this in a couple other policies too in other counties where it's problematic, that there's a piece in there that says, call ICE when the person is going to be released under the Trust Act. And that's problematic because if you call ICE, when someone is protected by the Trust Act, then ICE might just show up at the front door when they're being released and then you undercut the whole purpose of this bill, right, of this new law. 
Um, Chief Deputy Milo Fitch was really receptive to why we're concerned about that provision and said that he will revise that and they're going to alert ICE post-release after the person's released to give that person a chance to return to their family and go home. And so that, that's a positive thing. I'm still waiting for the actual language um, to see what it looks like, but that there is some communication, there's some, there's some feedback that's being given and they're, they're, they, seem, they seem to be responsive to that feedback. Um, Chief Deputy Milovich said that the permanent policy, the final policy, should be out this week. Um, and so as soon as we receive it, of course, we're gonna post it on our website. It's catrustact.org, catrustact.org, CA for California. Um, that website right now has a lot of Know Your Rights material in Spanish and in English. It also contains all the county policies we could find for different counties in California that apply to the Trust Act. And we will post the Sacramento policy on there as soon as it's available. Um, one more thing I wanted to point out is we also asked for statistics from Sacramento County and are trying to compare what's happening in Sacramento to other counties. Um, so we asked how many ice holds do you receive per week? How many ice holds are you not responding to so you're releasing that person and not holding them for immigration? We did the math, it looks like the average for Sacramento County as of January 1st until mid-February with the stats that we got, about 31% of ice holds they received, they did not respond to. About 31% of the ice holds they get, they're saying no to. That's actually quite low. Um, we, we have numbers from Alameda County, San Mateo County, Marin County, and I believe Sonoma County, and, the, and also some numbers from Los Angeles. And what we're finding there is that the Trust Act, the same law that we're talking about, the Trust Act has resulted in about 60 to 80% of ice holds not being responded to. So about double the people, basically, the percentage of people are being helped in those other counties. So there's some work, there's a lot of work basically to be done here to make sure the Trust Act is being applied correctly and helping as many community members as possible. Um, and I'll stick around and answer any technical questions, but that was not my piece of it. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks, especially to Martina and Julia for being here. There's no uh, federal law requiring this. It's just basically a favor. ICE is asking a favor of the jail. And ICE has admitted on many occasions now it's just a request. It's not mandatory. Um, actually, there's a lot of state court decisions you're going to get legal about this saying that ICE holds are voluntary. So when ICE asks that favor of the jail, the max the jail can hold that person is 48 hours, excluding weekends and holidays. That's, the, that's what normally happens. Under the Trust Act, you cannot hold that person for 48 hours, excluding weekends and holidays. You have to release them with a criminal matter allows them to be released. So I'm gonna take, for example, Julie and Martine's case. Martine was arrested, hope you don't mind me sharing, uh, but I think it's a really good story to share. Uh, Martine was arrested for a bogus noise complaint by a neighbor who's just basically harassing her. Um, and for that type of thing, uh, the charge there were no charges filed because it was just a bogus case. And without the immigration concerns, questions, um, they would, he would just be released that, that night, you know, be arrested, you know, I don't even know if you, should, if you should be arrested, but once you're arrested, you would just automatically be released in the criminal matter, okay? Um, and under the Trust Act, you would just be released, that's it. No holding for immigration for that 48 hours. If the Trust Act didn't help you, then you would be held for additional two days, excluding weekends and holidays. They didn't have to, but there wasn't a law saying you can't. Yep. Yeah, and before the Trust Act, it was still optional, but the Trust Act says you cannot do it for these types of cases. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. And if you have any, any further questions, we can we will have a QA and a towards the end. But just before I introduce our next speaker, keep in mind that this law passed January 1st, and those policies in each department of each sheriff, in each sheriff's department should have been placed and should have been implemented since that day, January 1st. This is what, March 24th, and we have cases that they have violated folks 
I'm, I'm sure families have been already separated. Folks are probably back in their own country with their kids here. We don't know what happens to those children. They probably end up in foster, foster homes when they have their own parents. So when we have laws that are advo advocating for the immigrant community, we're going to make sure that they are followed by each and every word. And I think it's fair to keep to make sure that the people we need to hold accountable are held accountable and that they follow the laws just as they expect us as citizens to follow their laws. Um, so next I'm going to go ahead and introduce our attorney Hector Cavazos, who has been representing a couple of cases and I will also ask him to talk to you about the services that he has um, for their community and the resources that are available for you all. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Hector Colossals. I have a law firm here uh, in Stockton. It's my main office, and I also have an office here in Elk Grove. Um, as you heard, I have a couple of the horror stories. Uh, stories of clients that I've had who have fallen victim to um, a lack of implementation of the Trust Act. Um, two of my clients were from here in uh, Sacramento County. Uh, the first happened fairly fairly soon after the implementation of the Trust Act. It was in the first weeks of January. Um, this gentleman, Fernando, was um, followed from a bar after he had been drinking. Uh, somebody followed him and turned in his license plate number. Uh, and essentially told the police where to find this gentleman. Uh, followed him until the police got there. He was drinking. He had a measurable amount of alcohol in his system. It is a fairly common accusation against people. Uh, under the Trust Act, though, when you're accused of having uh, driven while well, under the influence, uh, any other ordinary citizen or any other person would have been let go after a few hours in what's called a drunk tank or a few hours in jail. Unfortunately, uh, Fernando doesn't have. Um, legal status here in the United States. Somehow ICE got wind of that, we don't know how, but ICE did put a hold on it. Now, again, this is January, second week of January um, of 2014. So, um, the family called me, let me know that there was an ICE hold. They had contacted a bail bond agent, the bail bond agent didn't want to touch them, didn't want to go and put the bail uh, to get Fernando out because of this ice hole. Uh, I got involved immediately the morning after. Um, he was to be released, but unfortunately he was being held on the ice hole. Now, um, when I got involved, I, I went to the jail directly, spoke to a, uh, a lieutenant there, who essentially told me, we've heard about the act, but I don't know what we're doing about it. And, and again, this is early on, this isn't after the memo, this isn't after uh, we've uh, approached the sheriff's office uh, to, to get some responses. Um, so it, essentially, I was taken up the chain of command. Um, this particular lieutenant brought in the jailer, the lady who actually writes up um, the paperwork. And he asked her, uh, well, have you heard of this trust act? And her response was, I've heard of it, but we don't know what we're supposed to do with it. So I um, took the liberty of telling them what the Trust Act read. I had uh, my copy of the law with me, and I, I, I showed, them, showed them exactly what it was, and that this particular offense was not one of the offenses that was covered, or where they would have what's called discretion, or the ability, the authority, to hold somebody uh, when there is an ICE request. Um, what the answer I got from him was, well, we need to send this up to our captain. Um, and, and that was done. And unfortunately, that was late in the afternoon, so um, it, it, I, I didn't get a response until the next day. Um, but the next day, uh, I, I got a call early from the captain saying, we're going to release your guy. Your guy will be released. We've read the Trust Act. We're in agreement. He doesn't qualify, he needs to be out. 
So I, I sent the family over there. I went and I sat with the family in the waiting area at the jail. We sat for no less than four hours before I started asking questions. Um, it was probably about two o'clock in the afternoon when I, I decided too much time has passed and my guy should be out. When I asked the, the person there at the window, I was told um, that he had been released and they had no other information, just that he had been released. So I, I started to make calls and I called ICE. I called ICE here in Sacramento. They're two blocks away from the jail. Uh, and they denied having my guy. They said my guy was not there. Fernando was not with or in ICE custody. I, I walked back to the jail, asked another jailer, hey listen, I, I just heard my guy was released, he's not in ICE custody, he didn't walk out the front door, I need to find my guy, I was very worried. That's when this gentleman, this, this officer went into his records, he says, oh yeah, he was released, he was released to ICE. So, uh, he was released directly to ICE, and it wasn't through the front door, it was through the back door. ICE has access, as a police agency, as, as they should have, to uh, go in through the secure gates and to pick up people that they, they need to pick up. Um, and to a certain extent, I agree with that. That's fine. They need that access. But I have been told that my, my client would be released. And instead of releasing them, the, the story that went up to the captain was he was released and captured outside uh, in the public area. Well, we were there. That did not happen. And my client confirmed later that he was taken from inside the what's called the release room. Uh, he sat down in the release room. Ice came, said, you come over. They took him in the car, took him to Yuba City. So in Yuba City, that, that's one of their facilities locally here. They've got Yuba City, they've got Elk Road, which is Rio Casunas uh, Correctional Center. And they have, um, I, I believe they use the, the main jail also, but um, uh, it, it, it's one of their facilities. The next morning he was taken to ICE. Um, I had been on the phone with ICE, I had been on the phone with authorities, I had been on the phone with politicians. Uh, the next morning my client was released from ICE custody without bond. He was let out on his own recognizance. So, um, but unfortunately the damage had been done. ICE did do what, what they do best, and they, they did what's called a notice to appear, which is the initiation of deportation proceedings, and we are currently fighting that. Um, and, and we are also currently fighting this uh, uh, driving under the influence accusation. Um, the other story I have is of a gentleman named Misael, a client of mine also. Uh, the family came with the same story. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Misael was picked up after he ran into a parked car. He had been drinking. He was arrested. It was a lawful arrest. There's no question about that. But after his arrest, after he was set to be released, they, um, again, they had an ice hold on him, and the sheriff office decided to hold him on that ice hold. Uh, when I intervened, by the time the family got to me and, and by the time I got to the jail, he had already been released to ICE custody. But again, this was not one of those releases where he walked out the front door and was taken into custody in the public area. ICE was allowed to come in through the back door through the police uh, entry and wait for my client. In fact, take my client, take his clothes, make him get dressed in front of him, and then took him again to Yuba City. Um, again, by the time I got to him, um, he, he was already in Yuba City in ICE custody, but the next morning he was brought to Sacramento, and he was, um, again, with this client, with uh, my intervention, he was released on his own recognizance, so no bail. So, um, this happens a lot, unfortunately, and it, it happened a lot more previously, but, but unfortunately I, I'm still hearing stories about people who land in ICE custody. I, I believe a lot of it has to do with people not knowing their rights, not understanding um, what rights there are available to them, or not wanting to stir the pot, not wanting to uh, stick up for themselves because they don't have documents. 
they figure, I, I, I they might think that um, if they don't say anything, maybe I just can't pick them up, or they'll just be released. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, people need to know their rights. People need to um, uh, demand that their rights be, um, uh, or, or to exercise their rights, and that their rights be respected. Uh, and, and the first part of that is knowing your rights and being your, be your best advocate, your own advocate. Uh, sometimes for, for people, a lot of my clients tell me, well, I, I just can't tell the police, let me go, you're violating my rights, it's going to go bad for me. I, I don't really think that'll happen, but there's that fear. And, and the fear is stories like this where people are, are sent directly with us, and that reinforces the fear. And uh, unfortunately, people don't uh, exercise their rights. Uh, so I, I believe that's, that's a big part of it. But at the same time, the sheriff's offices, uh, including Sacramento, need to respect those rights. They need to know what the law says. It, it is the law. It's government code section 7282 and 7282.5. It, it is California law. It, is, it has not been challenged. And it, is, it applies equally to me, to you, and to anybody who has their feet here in California, whether they have documents or not. Uh, they can enforce their rights, they can uh, exercise their rights, and they, they are entitled to the same treatment as anybody else. Um, if you have family members or hear of people who, who find themselves in the same circumstances, tell them their rights. Let them know about their rights. And if they're afraid of, of advocating for themselves, call an attorney. Uh, an attorney will be out there, an attorney will help you, and, and would be your best advocate. They'll know exactly what to say, exactly who to speak to, in order to, to get that person released, in order for those rights to be respected. So those are my stories. Uh, again, I have offices in Stockton, I have offices in here in Elk Grove. Um, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, to, to meet with anybody personally if there are any personal questions. Uh, but know that we're out here. There, there are other attorneys here in the audience, up here with us. Um, there, there are several resources. I'm not the only attorney who does this, but I'm available, definitely. Thank you for your time. One of the persons that was with us when we met with Sheriff Jones was a public defender from Sacramento County. And he reached out to us because there were some cases apparently where juveniles were being turned um, to ICE. And Abogada Patricia Contreras is here to tell us a little bit more about that and what they're doing about that. inviting us to join you in this forum. The Public Defender of Sacramento County is Paulino Duran, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, however sent me as his representative. I am an attorney with the Public Defender's Office. I have been employed there for 15 years. Currently my assignment is with the Juvenile Division, so I only work with children. My job with the Public Defender's Office, often people ask, what is a Public Defender? No one has any idea what we do. We are attorneys that are paid for either by the state, the county, or the federal government to work for people who can't afford to hire their own attorneys. So we, in fact, have gone to law school and have graduated and have degrees as any other lawyer that you would pay in the community to represent you. Currently in my job with the juvenile division, we are encountering a problem that I think the community doesn't know about. When juveniles are arrested and brought to the juvenile detention center at Juvenile Hall, they are in inquired upon by the probation department of Sacramento County regarding their birth place, regarding their status in the United States, their address and where they live. And the problem is, is the Sacramento County probation department is using that information to then in turn call the Department of Immigration and report them. They are asking for ice holds. Currently, because they are minors, they are not being detained on the ice hold. However, the information is being sent to the Department of Immigration. 
We've had a client where they rejected to place a hold on him. However, they immediately started those proceedings that Mr. Cavazzo spoke of regarding sending him a notice to appear for his 18th birthday. The process is starting. By our clients ask, answering the information and speaking honestly with the Department of Probation, they in turn are helping the process to have themselves deported if they are undocumented. They don't know that. They believe in being honest with the probation department that they are being helpful. However, unfortunately, because they're not educated and they don't know their rights, they are giving them the information. The Public Defender's Office believes that this is illegal. We believe that the probation department has to stop reporting them to ICE. Juvenile proceedings are confidential. The courtrooms are closed to the public. No one can know who is inside the courtroom or what they are charged with, why they are there. There is a reason for that. Juvenile law is programmed to rehabilitate minors, not to punish them. And as such, all of their information and documents is confidential. However, the Probation Department of Sacramento County does not believe that. They believe that they are entitled to forward this information to the Department of Immigration. We have currently filed with the Public Defender's Office in the courts of Sacramento County a cease and desist order under Welfare and Institution Code 827. We believe that the Probation Department should be ordered to obtain all of the information that they gave to the Immigration Department regarding our clients, to have that information returned to the court and sealed under record in the courthouse. The Probation Department is currently fighting the public defenders. They have their attorney's county counsel filing opposition to our motion. We will be litigating this motion here in Sacramento County. The reason that I came before you tonight and in hopes is to reach out to the community. I have brought some flyers here with me today. They're in the back table. Please take flyers with you back to your community. Pass them out. Let people know what their rights are. They do not have to speak with the Department of Probation here in Sacramento County regarding their birthplace, their citizenship, what documents they do or do not have to be in this country. Help the public defenders help our community by educating them. My goal for tonight is even if we can reach just one person to help them understand that they don't have to be deported. They don't have to give out that information. That's what I'm hoping for today. The Public Defender's Office is here in Sacramento County. We are fighting for issues of immigration on a day-to-day -day basis. We do have clients that have immigration holds on them. We are hopeful that with the community together, we can fight the Department of Immigration and we can help our clients remain with their families here in their county. Thank you once again for inviting me. And up next, I'm going to have Sandy Espino come and talk to you about the bid mandate that's happening and also about the specifically the trust, trust that know your rights. Sandy? Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask, quería preguntar los que acaban de llegar si entienden inglés. Está la traductora aquí en este lado, si gustan, si se les hace más uh, fácil. I just wanted to let y'all know that she's here, the translator. Um, so um, I really want to emphasize the fact that um, the Trust Act should have been implemented starting January 1st, 2014. Um, and we're now in March, right? So that's a big problem. We're, we're what, like three months into the year and we're still having um, really high deportation rates. Um, last year in 2013, um, in January alone, there was 116 deportations, um, and this year there was 105. So we're seeing no improvement, and like Angela emphasized, other counties have over 50% improvement of their ice holds and deportation rates um, compared to Sacramento. And we understand Sacramento is a big city, right? Um, but that still doesn't excuse the fact that it has not been implemented, and a lot of families are being separated. Um, by April, we, we should be seeing about 2 million or more deportations. Um, that is more deportations since the year 1993. Um, so it's really, it's 
unexcusable. Um, this, this should have been implemented since the beginning of the year. Um, and I ask for all of y'all to please share this information that's being shared with you with your amongst your community members and your family members. Um, right, because we, we want to know, we want folks to know their rights, and we, we don't want any more family separations, um, as well as uh, folks being deported for uh, minor charges that they could have really been saved. So, um, Sacramento also has a little bit more of complexity because they actually have a contract with immigration services. Um, what does this mean? This means that ICE a day pays for 165 beds in Sacramento jail. And a day they pay Sacramento jail $100 per inmate, right? So this means that a year, Sacramento jail is getting funded $6,022,500 a year, right? So this is, we, we really want to question what does this mean, right? With the trust with our communities, what does this number mean? Um, and how are we taking these beds into account, the trust that we're supposed to be having in our communities? Um, so that's one of the big things uh, that's, that's a problem, right? We want to ask that question to our sheriff. Unfortunately, he can't be here. Um, but we really do want to have a meeting with him and see what does this mean for our community? Uh, because aside from the 165 beds, Sacramento Jail is entitled to hold more people in that. They can hold, cause they can hold about 2,000, correct me if I'm wrong, 2,000, right? Uh, inmates in the jail, so they can hold as many people as they want, but ICE is paying for 165 beds, 100 people plus $40 an hour for anywhere they need to take them. And Yuba City is only 41 minutes away from here, so that means they're getting $40, $80 to take them there and back. Um, so the, it's being completely funded for, and, and for us, for our community, that should be unacceptable because we're talking about families, right? We're talking about um, a lot of people that could be saved with these years. And the contract, um, after reading it, so it w was actually just renewed last year, at the end of last year. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the thought, right? So this is being thought about before the Trust Act implementation. Um, so at the end of last year, this was signed in August, and we're in March, right? And the Trust Act implementation has not been implemented. Um, so what does that mean for our community? And this contract, it looks like it's being renewed every three years. So we have three years of 165 beds a day for 365 days of the year. Um, so we really want to question what does that mean for our community? What does that mean for the people, our neighbors, our family members, um, which is really concerning. And, and I, I think a fellow, uh, a few of us have already talked about Know Your Rights. Um, you are completely entitled to not sharing any information regarding your immigration status with any authority. Um, if you are being pulled over, um, there are some states that require you to share your name. And uh, if they ask you for your license, you are required to show it. But other than that, you are not required to answer any other question unless there is suspicion of something else. They are not required to search your car. They are not required to go in your home and question your family members without any type of warrant. The, only the uh, judge in court can order you to answer any question. The officers cannot. Um, so just taking that into account that you are not required to answer any question by the officer, especially regarding immigration status, and we heard about the juvenile cases, right? That's, that's very sad, right? These are the folks, um, dreamers, documented folks, right, that are, that, or could apply for DACA, um, and once they're put in, in these proceedings, it makes things a lot more difficult. Um, Yeah, I, I think that was it for me. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. And again, if you guys have any questions, we're going to have time in a few minutes. Now, I want to introduce Lieutenant Andres, who will be speaking about um, his role in the Sheriff Department and talking to us a little bit more about the Trust Act implementation that's happening in our county today. Good evening. I was uh, a week ago the commander of the Sacramento County Main Courthouse downtown, but uh, I got transferred. I'm going to be promoted next week, and I'll be the commander of the Sacramento County Main Jail downtown. So uh, I'm all kind of new to all of Trust Act. I did read, read it and provide some stats for you guys. But uh, 
The main thing I want to uh, say tonight is that rep I'm representing the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Scott Jones, and the sheriff I talked to last week has promised to comply with the California Trust Act, so we are going to have the permanent um, Trust Act policy for Sacramento County, which is good news. So that way there's no uh, confusion about the Trust Act, and then we will have that distributed to all of our employees downtown at Sacramento County Main Jail, and also at the uh, RCCC in Oak Grove. So if you have any questions, uh, I have business cards, and the main thing I want to say tonight is that we'll have open communication with the organizations tonight, so you guys can email me. I've already been in contact with you guys, so we will start being in compliance and the policy will be permanent, uh, most likely effective next week. So if you have any questions, feel free to come up and we can talk further. But I'll be downtown at the Sacramento County Main Courthouse downtown, so we are close. I'm actually going to open it right now for questions from the public to any of our panelists. And I'll take uh, Professor Eric Vega. I have like about four or five questions, so I hope that's okay. <laughs> To the public defender, um, is it possible for immigrant rights organizations to join on as community organizations to your uh, appeal? Yes, definitely. We have reached out to the immigration law firm that we consult with in San Francisco to join us. The motion that we filed is actually going to be heard in the juvenile courthouse on April 1st at 8.30 in the morning in one of our departments to be determined at this point. I believe it's going to be Department 97. However, yes, we are eager to join with local hopeful, hopefuls such as ourselves that are planning on hopefully vindicating with the probation department that we are right and they should not release that confidential information. So I can uh, touch bases Great. with you after, please. Great. Thank you. It, it may be that our organization and others would really want to do something like that. Thank you. Uh, I had a, a bunch of questions for the sheriff. Uh, and I hope this is the beginning of a good relationship. I hope it's not just in this stadium, but that we meet in other offices and you have other organizations and other people talking with you and the sheriff. I'd like to know um, what your plan is to train all your officers around the Trust Act. If I call up a sheriff and I say, you know, I think there's an illegal living next door to me, what are you going to do? What, is, what do you do as a sheriff officer if somebody just says, there's an illegal next door? What do you do? Well, I can start to answer that. Sure. At, at, inside the correctional facilities, those that permanent policy will be in place very soon. So. That training will be distributed to everybody and it won't be necessary to be in compliance with that law because if, if not, it will go to the supervisor who will either discipline that person or there will be ramifications for not following that. And that's directed all the way down from the sheriff all the way down. In patrol division, the, I, I can't speak for that because I don't work in that division. I work in the correctional division. So that would be coming forward countywide through the sheriff's department so other other division commanders will be responsible for their employees but it it'll information will trickle down from all the way up from the sheriff all the way down so there'll be ramifications if that's not followed I believe once it's permanently in place that trust law act will be followed. So if somebody calls you and said sheriff there's an illegal next door what what's your response? Well unless there's an active felony crime or even a misdemeanor crime the officer will go there, figure out what the issue is, and resolve that. Officers typically respond to 15 to 20 calls per day, and so I don't, I don't believe that would be something that they could follow up on regarding immigration, their status, and where they're born. So once, once the policy is in place, I think it, a, lot of, a lot of these questions and will be answered, and it will be all the way from the sheriff down. So it, it'll be strict. The sheriff is the main representative for the county. And if you don't follow what the sheriff says, you will be in trouble yourself. So it, it will be followed. We've taken a look at the proposals from Santa Clara and Alameda and San Francisco. And they look 
better than what I've seen from Sacramento. Are you open, you think the sheriff is open to sit down at a table and listen to better practices? I think that the sheriff is very open, especially with uh, Chief Milo Fitch, uh, who is my new chief. Those guys have been very uh, active communicating and act actively going through the draft and making changes from what Angela said. So they're open to communication, and I think they are making changes. There was just a change that Angela said, and they're already considering making changes. So if there's other thing you want to add, you can, you can probably go through Angela and forward that information to the sheriff and to Chief Milo Fitch. I'm like the third person down once they make those changes. And from, from me down, we will just follow what the sheriff and the chief says. So if there's information that you want to present, I can surely pass that information to them. If I could just add to that, um, I did talk with uh, Chief Deputy Milo Fitch, and he is very responsive. He's actually a great contact to have in the Sheriff's Department, so I appreciate that. I did ask him about the Santa Clara, San Francisco, and Alameda policies, which basically helps more people. There's less exceptions in the Trust Act, so it helps more people. And he said that for now, the Sacramento Sheriff's Department's following the Trust Act and not providing more protections for now. Um, but I do encourage people in the community to keep those have those conversations with the Sheriff's Department and really encourage them to go in the direction of providing more protections. The Trust Act allows more protections. It just doesn't allow less. Um, you, you, it, can help, it can help more people. Basically, if there's a stronger local policy, that's the policy that is binding. And it makes sense to have a stronger policy because it means stronger community policing because there's less exceptions where contact with police uh, might result in being picked up by immigration. There's a lot of words and sentences in this stuff. I still don't quite understand the Intergovernmental Services Agreement that Sandy was talking about. But it seems like there's an economic incentive for the sheriff to detain undocumented people. In other words, it's in his interest to make money. Is that your understanding, Sheriff? Well, my understanding is the, the sheriff has fallen of the federal law for quite a while until he went to Washington, came back, and decided to follow the California Trust Act. So there is money that's being provided for housing uh, people on holds. And so it is quite a bit of money because there is a big number of inmates per day times 365 days, like you heard. So there is money there, but uh, in the future, there still could be people put placed on holds for violent felony crime. So not saying it's going to go all the way to zero, but they're only going to be held on violent felonies still still uh, money that needs to be paid to the county from the federal government because of those holes. So, uh, at RCCC, are you happy to people transfer there from out of the county in order to circumvent the trust act protections? I, I haven't heard that, but if you have a question, I can surely follow up. I'm brand new to the main jail. I was at the courthouse. I'll give you a business card. We can email the and answer the question for you fully to your understand. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, so regarding the policy that um, is in place, it says that the sheriff can call ICE post-release. Is that the wording is can, may, should, required, obligated, because that's a big difference whether you guys are going to or whether the policy is going to be that they have to. And then if a phone call is made post-release, is ICE going to be going after those people outside of it? And, you know, going to their home, looking for them, and so on and so forth, because I'm going to assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they're going to be provided the information as far as name, address, and all of that information. Yeah, the sheriff advised me last week that we're not going to be in the immigration business. We're going to be in the crime prevention, and we're going to be arresting criminals for misdemeanors and felonies. But Andrew Paul will probably have better information exactly how the wording on the draft is going to be. It's not in place yet. I'm not exactly sure the wording on that. But uh, maybe she can answer that. Thank you for that question, Julie. It's a great question. So the question is, um, for when I talked about the uh, draft final policy that is on the Trust Act the department's going to release, that we had a discussion between 
me and uh, Chief Deputy Fitch about notification that ICE and I had expressed that the community is very concerned about notifying ICE, especially before someone's released, because you're really undercutting the purpose of this law uh, by basically letting ICE know they can come and pick them up when they're about to be released under the Trust Act. So he understood that concern and, and does want to address that, and he talked about the reason he wanted to notify ICE, and the reason is that to let ICE know that we're not responding to this detainer when we're releasing the person. I mean, I, I technically think you still don't need to tell ICE this, but um, he, he does want to do that, and he's saying it's post-release, and I asked him um, at what time, you know, are you giving them five minutes a day, like how much time are you gonna give that person to be released to go home? Uh, he said it's gonna be a reasonable amount of time. I haven't seen the language yet, um, but he will send me the draft language before it's finalized. Um, I don't know if it's a shall or a should, um, but I, my guess is from the way he was talking, it's probably a shall. It's probably a, re a, a required procedure that they notify ICE after the person's released, um, just that they're released. Um, and you're reminding me that I should ask, what else are you going to tell ICE? Are you going to give them an address? Like, what else are you giving them? Um, he did tell me, and he was very open and transparent about this, that because of this contract between ICE and the jail, this IGSA contract, ICE does have access to all their computers. So even if the Sheriff's Department doesn't give information about addresses, et cetera, ICE probably has access to them. And so then the next question is, will ICE then go that extra step to go to someone's house to pick them up if the Trust Act helped them? And I think with community support, with community pressure, with outrage, whatever, if that does happen, I think ICE will be less likely to do it, basically. Um, and then one thing to clarify is that, um, I think it's a little confusing, the IGSA contract, the Intergovernmental Service Agreement, that's about ICE renting a, a specific beds in the jail. That's different from the ICE detainer. The ICE detainer is about when someone's arrested on a criminal matter, and then the criminal matter allows them to be released, let's say no charges were filed, they're found innocent, what, what, you know, they're released on bail, et cetera. And we're saying you can't hold them in the sheriff jail bed, that's not rented out to ICE, for extra time for immigration to pick them up. So there's actually two different things we're talking about. Some jails do not have these contracts, these IGSA contracts, um, so, so that's it's just different. Sacramento does have this contract, but it's different from an ICE detainer. If the person's not being held for a crime and they're gonna be released, why would their information be given to ICE? Because at that point, there should be no connection whatsoever. I mean, technically, I didn't even know they were there. Yes, that, that hopefully will be set in that policy when it's finalized, so I haven't seen it yet, so hopefully that is there because the, the sheriff's told me we're not going to provide a lot of information to ICE. They could come into jails, they could do their own research, they could still put a detainer on people, but for the sheriff's department, we're just going to be doing our normal releases and let them people go that when, you know, when the time is right. Sorry. So one other thing that um, you had mentioned, and I'm sorry, I know your person was on dress, but I forgot the rest. You had said that um, Sheriff Jones had decided to follow the Trust Act. And so I'm a little confused, so I'm hoping I can get some clarification because I saw a video earlier today that said that there is no decision to follow, whether you follow federal law or state law, because there is no federal law stating that you have to give information to ICE. So in my mind, I feel like there is no decision that needs to be made because there is no federal law that requires that. It's a request, and, I, and that's kind of where I'm getting to. I just, I'm confused with the wording. I hear all this hopeful and trickling down effect and eventually, and deciding to, those are not words that give me a lot of hope. Okay, well the sheriff went to Washington DC and, and talked to the leaders of federal ICE, and after that he made his decision what he wants to do, if he's, if he's gonna follow the Trust Act or if he's gonna keep the normal policy he had before. So from what he told me last week is he is gonna follow the California Trust Act. I don't know all the details of that because the final policy's not here yet, but within a week or two, that would be safe. And just as a follow-up, I want to say um, this forum is very helpful. 
Um, I'm going to let Chief Deputy Fitch know from tonight's conversation that the community is very concerned about notifying post-release, and that's still very problematic. And are you going to make that a shall or a should? And also, what information are you willing to give? So I, I'll provide, based on tonight's discussion, I'm going to let him know that that's what the community is feeling. Could you also add that uh, we're interested in more information about the IGSA and encouraging community stakeholders that could be involved in removing that contract when it comes time to do so? Or if, there's, if they're open to considering whether uh, they would nullify the contract or that possible? Yes, I will I'll give you one, like I said, I'll give you my business card to have an email effect, or sorry, email, so we can exchange uh, information back and forth. So I will ask the sheriff that question, and, and that's a good question, so, but that's a policy that he's going to have to make a decision on. And uh, being a chief or even captain, we follow what the sheriff wants. But we'll definitely ask the question. Well, another feeling that I hope you will take back to the sheriff is that we should get together with reps from the people that are here tonight to do this again with him. No disrespect to you, but I think it's important that we look him in the eyes and say, this is what we want. These are what our expectations are. Agreed. And if you could just send that back to that, that feeling, that sentiment. Sure, and I'll pass that information along too. And, and like I said, the best way to get a hold of me is through email. I'm uh, right down in Sacramento County Main Jail, and I'll pass all that information to him, and hopefully your next meeting of forum, he will be here to answer those questions face to face. Julie? Um, so one other question, and I don't know how well, but I know that this went into effect January 1st, and I know for just any normal citizen, when a law takes effect, we're required to follow it. So my question is, is the sheriff going to be held accountable for not following the law? We're three months, almost four months, we're April 1st pretty soon into this, and we still don't have full implementation. We don't have a policy in effect. Officers still haven't been trained. We don't know about patrol officers. I mean, there's still a lot of unknowns that when I'm thinking on a large scale, having to um, get people trained on such a large scale, you're talking months and months. I mean, it could be till the end of the year so this is fully implemented when the law has already been in effect for a complete three months. If I were to get arrested or say, well, I wasn't aware of the law, they'd be like, oh, too bad, you should have been. Well, I don't think it's going to take months and months to train people. Basically, this policy is going to be several pages long. The officers will probably be required to review and sign off that they read it and understand it. That could, that could be in a short time frame. From what the sheriff is saying, we are already starting some of the processes to uh, review people under the Trust Act, so they already started that. I don't think the training part of it is going to be lengthy at all. So. The part about the, the sheriff and, you know, being questioned about why he did not implement it, he told me that he wanted to go to Washington, D.C., do all the research, make his own decision how he wanted to follow it, follow it or not. So he's ensured that he is going to follow it and have that policy in place soon. development process, I hope all of the uh, stakeholder groups that are here tonight have an opportunity to sit down as it's developed to ensure specificity. I think that if things are left too vague, it's going to be left to open to interpretation. And we all know that once you do that, everybody's got their own idea of what was said. So knowing that, what kind of consequences will be built in for overzealous police? Well, I believe under the Trust Act, there's certain felony crimes that are still allow ICE to put a detainer and hold people. So you're, if it doesn't have the specific penal codes and people don't follow the Trust Act, I'm sure immediately a supervisor or a manager will be notified either through an attorney, public defender's office, there'll be somebody making a complaint. So they will be held accountable if they don't follow the policy from the sheriff. In the back, Ivy. Okay, so um, what is the policy for car impoundment in the Sacramento? The policy for car impoundment? For what? Policy for car impoundment? Yeah, I'm not sure about that because 
even though I work for 20 years in the Sheriff's Department, we don't typically tow too many cars. We're not uh, this highway patrol, but uh, you know, like I said, I can follow that up with an email and try to answer you back with the best answer possible, but I don't have an answer tonight. Over here, Jenny. So I just wanted to lay a message to the sheriff. Um, this was a community forum for him to come here and build the trust with the community. Um, the sheriff is an elected official, so I want the message to be sent that if he's not going to work with us to build this trust for our families that are being separated, where it's time to vote someone else in to his position. Yeah, I don't think the sheriff is against the California Trust Act, but he did go to Washington, researched everything, and made a decision how he wants to follow this. So he is going to follow this with his permanent policy. So he is, uh, I'm not sure what his calendar is tonight, but uh, I will relay the message that it's important to him to be here for future events like this for. His research was done with ICE directly. Was that the extent of his research? Did he go to the agency that's issuing the detainers and that's the only decided to look into? Or did he get some objective, neutral, legal standpoints? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure who else he talked to, but the sheriff is an attorney, so I believe he's told me he fully researched this before he made his final decision. Last question over here. Buenas noches. Soy Efraín Gutiérrez. Tu su representante al sheriff por 10 años. Okay. Hay un grupo que se llama SOCAM. Sheriff's Advisory Community Advisory Board. I have represented my community. Uh, he represented the community for cerca de 10 years. He passed por three sheriffs. Blanes, McGuinness, and este. Les puedo decir que este es el mejor. Mm. Digo, claramente, este nos escucha. Okay. Y ellos saben porque yo voy cada mes y les doy como bien bonito mi gente, ¿ok? So they know uh, that no está bien la cosa, ¿ok? And they know that they got to do better. I think if the sheriff thought about the Trust Act, it's because gente como yo, el profesor Eric, el Parmo Hernández y otros aquí, le hemos estado poking them, ¿ok? So saben que tienen que hacer algo. You understand uh, the pregunta. I, I, I hear your, your, your feelings. It's three months. What's happened? Uh, keep in mind that sometimes federal laws come in and it takes years for them to get implemented. As much as we would like them to be overnight, it just doesn't happen. Bureaucracy and so on just takes a lot of time. Okay? So, all I want to end with is uh, I know Milo Fitch personally. I will send him an email personally as the liaison to my community. And I will ask that when this gets ready, that we have a stakeholder meeting with the community, and you all will be invited, okay? Si es aquí, donde quieran ustedes. I will make sure that that happens, so we can sit down, go line by line, y lo que no nos guste, lo, lo mandamos. Y lo que queremos, seguimos. Porque como dijiste, señorita, lo corremos next time, okay? Add a couple more things uh, regarding the trust act um, it protects against it, like every misdemeanor except domestic violence and felony DUI so I really want to emphasize that because um, going back to not knowing your rights um, and thinking that every crime or even when we get stopped a lot of our undocumented community um, has a lot of fear and and I really want to emphasize that this is called the trust act right it's called La Acta de Confianza, right? Because we want to have that relationship and that trust with, uh, with our uh, officials and with our people from the council and our rep the, the people that are supposed to represent us, essentially, right? Um, so I really want to emphasize that this is called the Trust Act for a reason, um, and we really want to spread that with, um, amongst our community members. Um, and the Sacramento Immigration Alliance is a great resource if um, we all know about any cases or um, any violations of the Trust Act. Uh, they're open for contact, or if you'd like to talk to any one of us after, uh, we're definitely open to answer any more questions. Can I just say one thing really quick? I just want to kind of take it back.
piggyback on everyone else's because I, I know you're here on behalf of the sheriff, but obviously there's a lot of things that you can't, you're not aware of or not you know, aware of the things where he did when he did an investigation in Washington DC or whatever. And I think that's why it's important that we be here because we want to be able to get that information directly from him because his representatives don't know it. And so the only way we're going to be able to build that trust is to have that direct contact with him. Oh, if there's any other questions, we're going to stick around. There's going to be food in the back. I do want to thank very, very much our panelists. If you can give them a round of applause. And then we're going to thank you very much for being here. I know you're representing the sheriff. However, we do expect him to be here. I think he is the person to be held accountable. Um, not quite sure about all those questions, but I do hope we'll be in touch with you and you'll be our point person to follow up with. So you will hear, you will be hearing a lot from us. So please uh, make sure that you express our message to him and um, that we are here for our community. And lastly but not least, I'm just gonna have Jenny Morales come and tell you a little bit about the resources that are available for the community. And with that said, we're gonna go ahead and end the, and end the forum. My name is Jenny Morales. I work with La Familia Counseling Center. It's a nonprofit that's been around in Sacramento for 40 years. Uh, we have a lot of services for the community. A lot of people sometimes aren't aware of this, but I'd like to spread the message. And if you guys know anyone who would be interested, please let them know. Um, we have GED services for both adults and young, um, young adults, um, out of school um, youth services, where we promote, um, they, they can get the high school diploma or GED, plus we put them in job placements. So it's a really good program for those individuals who um, don't see high school as an option. Uh, we also have uh, a job training center for any adult uh, along with the computer lab. And the computer lab is open for all the community. You can come in here in La Familia, use it for internet, faxing, printing, anything. We have uh, resume building workshops, job interviewing workshops, and we also um, do computer basic skills. So if you know anybody who you know doesn't know what a mouse, keyboard, Microsoft Word is, which is a reality in our community, um, you know they can come in, and we have these every week. It's a really cool class, um, and we will also be offering the GED uh, GED uh, diploma in Spanish starting in July. Um, in addition, I work with the Birth and Beyond program, which is specifically for families that have children ages zero to five. It is an amazing program. Uh, we have two components of the home visitation that goes into your home and they provide you uh, nurturing, nurturing parenting skills, which you know just teaches you to love your children in very, very different ways. Um, and then the Family Resource Center, which is a lot of fun. We do a lot of activities. The Spring Fling is coming up April 15th. We have a school readiness fair where we provide information on how to enroll your children in preschool and um, activities to do at home with your children to develop their skills so that they are ready for kindergarten. Um, in addition to that, we have a mental health program. So that is open for anyone ages 0 to 21. So if you need counseling, family counseling, domestic violence counseling, please call us. Um, there are always people there um, helping and open. Uh, we have various groups for teen parents, for um, youth that are 16 to 21. I mean, it's just an array of um, information. If you need more, please feel free to visit me at the back table and I will be happy to talk to you. Um, and if we can't find the resource for you, we'll definitely help you find it. Yeah. Thank you everyone and please step to the back, there's going to be some food for you all.